Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar, and I'm here with Pat Bergeson. Pat is a interesting player in that he's a just as popular a player for guitar as he is for harmonica, which is kind of a rarity just to be a harmonica player and get session work in general is a rarity. But uh, let me tell you a little bit about Pat. He's got a great, great story. He's a Nashville session player. He's literally played and toured with some of the absolute best guitar pickers on earth. Uh, he's played with Chet Atkins. He played on Chet Atkins' album, Sneaking Around, alongside Chet and Jerry Reed. He also played on Chet's album, Read My Licks and Simpatico. And Pat had some co-writes on that one as well. He continued writing, touring, and recording with Chet for several years and was says it was naked as one of Chet's top. I think it meant it was named. You weren't naked in front of Chet, right? It was you were named. Not that I can remember. <laughs> he was named as one of Chet's top twelve favorite guitarists of all time. In Chet's own article, he wrote in Vintage Guitar Magazine. He's also played on records with Lyle Lovett, Allison Krauss, Dolly Parton, Peter Frampton, Michael McDonald, Tommy Emmanuel, Bill Frizzell, Susie Bogus, Chrissy Hine, Bill Evans. And many others. And he's drinking water. I'm going to just read that last part over. <laughs> you can slow down. Now is not the time to speed up. <laughs> I got I got to go back and cut that out. That, that, I'm sorry, man. No, it's cool, man. Do you want to get another one? You want to hold? Get no, I'm good. I'm All good. Right. <laughs> I'm good. Sorry about that. That's no, right. We're doing an totally, interview. Totally okay. fine. I was, on, I was doing an interview one time with someone, and uh, I'm not going to say who it was, but because you know the person, and they were fidgety and they had like like stuff in their hand like screwdrivers and they kept going <laughs> and i said i uh i'm you know you might want to stop banging because no one hears you <laughs> and, and they kept going back to banging because it was like nervous energy anyway yeah. uh Pat's also played on records with Lyle Lovett, Allison Krauss, Dolly Parton, Peter Frampton, Michael McDonald, Tommy Emmanuel, who he also tours with, Bill Frizzell, Susie Bogus, Chrissy Hine, Bill Evans, and loads of others. He's been a teacher and producer, and he's played on loads of Grammy Award-winning records, and he's appeared on loads of movie soundtracks. He's also been in Le Brer, which is touring Allman Brothers alumni, featuring Butch, Butch Trucks, Jaimo, O'Teal Burbridge, Jack Pearson, Mark Quinones, Bruce Katz, and Lamar Williams Jr. And he also works with Tommy and teaches with Tommy at his courses, Tommy Emanuel it is. And he's played at the Tommy Emanuel Classics and Christmas Tour. And if you want to check out a really, really cool, well-done short documentary, uh, like maybe 30 minutes, um, check out on YouTube. It's called A Tribute to Chet Atkins. It's uh, made by Gretsch Guitars. It's just great. You can see Pat playing. and You go on YouTube, you see him playing with his, uh, with Tommy and uh, playing guitar and harmonica. And Anyway, man, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Oh, yeah. Glad to be here, Greg. Thanks for having me. And Pat also does uh, voiceovers for Al Franken uh, better than Al Franken does. So he, he's available for hire for that. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not as funny as Al Franken, though. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, hey, I was a big fan of him when he was a comedian. Yeah, he was a really funny yeah. guy, like on Saturday oh. Night Live back in the day. Oh, his great. He was great, great, very funny guy. Dry, deadpan sort of uh, mm -hmm. humor. I like that. Hey, yeah. so you're living in New York City, and Chet Atkins calls you. So if you could tell the whole story, I know you're originally from Chicago. Like, how long had you been in New York at that point in time? What made you move to New York originally? And, you know, t take take it from there, man, the story about how Chet called you, because it's a phenomenal story. Well, I uh, I moved to New York to finish college. I was at University of Illinois studying, studying music there. I was taking composition and classical guitar, and I was studying jazz, and, you know, I was in the jazz band and and I was in the University of Illinois Russian Folk Orchestra, which was a real great experience, playing Russian folk music on the domras and balalaikas and all that. And and uh, but I, uh, you know, I was out there in the middle of nowhere in Champaign, Illinois, and I I heard about this school out in New Jersey, right outside of New York City, called William Patterson 
College. It's now called William 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 Patterson University. And so I transferred out there and I knew one person out there in New York. I had one friend out there. My cousin lived there. He was a uh, uh, conductor with the New York City Opera, Scott Bergeson. I knew him, but I didn't see him very often. He was a very busy guy. And uh, I had this one friend, my friend Tom DeFaria, he's a drummer, and I moved out to, to New York and moved in with him, started going to school at William Patterson. And at William Patterson, they had Rufus Reed and all this these great jazz faculty from New York who taught there. And so I got to study with all these great people, Joe Lovano and Harold Mayburn and all these great people. And I had Harry Leahy as my guitar teacher and Bucky Pizzarelli as my guitar teachers. So it was a really great experience, amazing experience. And I finished school there and decided just to stay out in New York. And I was out there 10 years. And so in that time I was there, I started teaching at the national guitar workshop. It was called national guitar summer workshop when I was there. And, mm -hmm. and I got to be friends with a guy named Robert Lee Castleman. And he's a, he's a songwriter, really fantastic, super talented songwriter and guitar player. And he uh, met Chet Atkins when Chet Atkins came as a guest one week. And, that, and it turned out that particular week I went camping with a friend of mine, so I didn't get to see Chet. So I got back and I heard that my friends, everybody met Chet and how great it was. And, and this friend of mine gave Chet a demo tape of this song that I played on. It was Robert Lee Kaufman and I did this demo. It was this real crappy demo we did in his apartment. And I played guitar on it. And Chet heard the song, really liked the song, and he ended up cutting it on his new record with Jerry Reed called Sneaking Around. So he cut the song, and in that time... So you got you got a, a credit on for a Chet song that you didn't even meet him at the time. No, no. I just played on the demo that okay. RL, okay. Robert Lee Castleman, gave to Chet. Yeah, I just was on the demo, and Chet cut the song, but Chet liked my guitar playing on the song and kept asking Robert Lee Castleman, like, who is that guy who played guitar on that demo? And in that period of time, uh, Robert moved to Nashville, and, and uh, uh, Chet's manager – liked RL's songwriting and he decided to manage him. So Ch RL, this, we call him RL, Robert Lee Castleman. RL, uh, he was being managed by Chet's manager. And, and so, yeah. So anyway, he was hanging out with Chet all the time, you know, and, and he kept asking him all the time about me. And so, I get, he was very taken with what I did. And so not long after that, I don't remember how long it was. I came down to Nashville to stay for a few days because I was going down to Muscle Shoals to do a spec deal with RL. And so what is that? What is that if you could explain that a spec deal was that they were going to, you were going to cut some songs on, on him to try to get him a record deal. Okay. So, we went down to Muscle Shoals, and that was very cool. I got to record with Roger Hood and David – I mean, David Hood and David Roger Hood. Hawkins yeah. and Steve Nathan and all these incredible session guys down in Muscle Shoals. I spent the weekend down there working with them, and Chet heard I was in town. And so he told RL, he said, hey, you send that guy to my office. So I went up and met Chet, and I hung out with him at his office for – for a whole afternoon just sitting there passing the guitar back and forth got some great photos of us passing my green stratocaster back and forth you know and him showing me licks and me showing him things and he was asking me hey yeah how'd you play that show me how you did that you know and of course i thought that was so cool how he was so much just like one of the guys and just another musician who wanted to learn licks on the guitar he was always just trying to new, learn new stuff constantly. This and is up in Nashville. This is after you at left. This is, yeah. Shows? This, okay. No, yeah, I left Nashville and I went back to Nashville to stay like, you know, when the session was over. Right. Okay. And so, yeah. So he 
hung out, you know, we hung out for the afternoon and I thought, well, that's the last time I'll ever hear of him. And that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me, you know? So, um, so months later I got a phone call out of the blue. I came home after a weekend of playing weddings and bar mitzvahs up in New York and got a message from Chet Atkins on my answering machine saying, Hey Pat, you want to come down here in Nashville, play on this record with me and Jerry Reed? <laughs> Give me a call, you know, and uh so I called him and flew down there a few days later and started overdubbing on his record. And that's that's how it happened. You know, it was basically he heard me on a demo tape, he met me, liked me, called me to play on a session. And so when I got down there to the session, that was a really, really neat story because I flew into Nashville, got there real early in the morning and went straight over to his house. And I walk in, I don't know, it was like eight in the morning or something. My flight was like 5 a.m. or something. I can't remember. I I walk into his house, go into his basement, into his studio, and he's down there in the, in the control room, just messing around and, you know, and he, I say hi and we, I start setting up my gear and plugging in my pedals and stuff. And then I hear the toilet flush, you know, and out walks Jerry Reed. And, um, the first thing he said, he turns to Chet and he goes, is that the little son of a bitch? And he goes, and Chet says, (laughs) yeah, that's him. And so he comes over to me and gets gets behind me. I'm sitting in the chair, and he gets me in a headlock. And he says, oh, yeah, you like girls? And I said, well, yeah. He goes, you like playing the guitar? I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> he said, you like being behind the wheel? I said, I don't know. Yeah, are we going to drive somewhere? He goes, no, I'm going to run your ass over. <laughs> and that was the first thing he said to me. And then um, – So what are you thinking that point? Thinking, like I got oh, I just – I got I got, I got to learn uh, yeah. Nashville talk. Oh, he was hysterical. He was a very funny guy. And so we start to get to work and we go in and we listen to the tunes. And, um, you know, we get a sound. He, we, I plugged into his old Standell amp hmm. and I had the amp turned down really low. And I had my rat distortion. And I have to say the tone I got on that recording is really great and you know that his his old amp with the 15 inch speaker and the you know it was just a great sound and he had the big old rca ribbon mic on it and um this is chet's amp or jerry's amp chet's amp i was playing through his standout amp yeah and so so he says um yeah, well, here's what you're going to do, you know, because we didn't have a chart written out or anything. You know, we just listened to the tune. One of the tunes was Summertime. And there was a couple other tunes. I can't remember. Played on three or four tunes. And I'm sorry, Pat, how old are you at this point? This, I think I was 32. Okay. And how old were Chet and Jerry, ballpark? Probably mid-60s. Okay. Yeah. So... Um. Chet says, well, here's what you're going to do. I'm going to stand here behind the glass. You're going to go out there in the other room. And when I put my arm up in the air, you play. And when I put my arm down, you stop. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm out there sitting on a stool looking through the the control room, watching Chet with his arm up in the air. And then, you know, and I'm playing a solo and then I put his arm down and I stop playing, you know. Oh, my God. So it was just funny, you know, and, uh, you know, a couple of takes. And this solo was, I think, the first take I I did on that tune. And then, um, I don't know, we were probably there in the studio actually working for an, I don't know, it wasn't very long at all, hour or something, you know, blew some solos. and, and And then we sat and listened to the rest of the record just to, for the fun of it and listen to a bunch of it. And, and, uh, yeah, and it was just, it was great. It was just really great. And so after it was over, you know, we took some photos and stuff and then Chet gets, you know, puts his arm around me as we're walking out and he goes, you did a real good job. Just like I knew you would. 
Man, and, that must have made you feel I, like a million oh, it, bucks. It was incredible. Yeah, it was incredible because, you know, you can imagine I was terrified going in there because – this is Chet Atkins. Chet Atkins, you know, and here I am. I get called out of the blue, you know. Well, it wasn't completely out of blue. Like I said, I didn't meet him before that. But, you know, here I am, like, living in New York City, you know, playing weddings on the weekend to make a living and, you know, occasional gigs during the week and a few sessions here and there. But, you know, I was scraping by. And I was, as a matter of fact, at that point in my life, I was really ready to – I was either going to move completely out of New York or just I don't know what I would have done because I was really at a turning point. I had just moved. I had just moved out to. uh, Well, you know, I guess maybe it was a year later when I moved out of town, but my lease had run out and stuff. And I just I was ready to get out of there. And um, so, yeah, when he called, I was just. Yeah, I was absolutely thrilled. I couldn't believe I was going to get to go play on a record with Chet and Jerry Reed. I mean, it was just insane to me. It just, you know, it's something I would never would have imagined in a million years. And, um, I mean, he really, you know, I owe him so much. It's just unbelievable. And I'm unbelievably grateful to, to him for everything, you know, and all that because, you know, I don't know what I would have done after that. And so, I mean, he basically gave me a career, you know, from that day on, I've never stopped working. So, you know, I was working before that, but, you know, it wasn't even a, and it was a year probably after that, that I moved to Nashville. And, um, but anyway, right after that, we did that session. I said, well, I'll see you later. He goes, where are you going? I said, I don't know. I guess I'm going back to, to New York. He goes, no, you ain't. You know, he said, so I ended up staying in Nashville for about four or five more days. He, he kept me at the hotel. He took me out to lunch every day and dinner every day and, like, introduced me to everybody. You know, all all these musicians and friends, you know, and and uh, it was amazing. You know, he told Terry McMillan, the, you know, the harmonica player, great, the late Terry McMillan, great harmonica player, you know, told him about me. And so he came to lunch with us one day and got to meet him and talk to him. And it was really amazing. So then when I flew back, funny part of that story, though, is also that the day I flew back to New York, I had to play a wedding gig. And it happened to be with the worst band you've ever heard. <laughs> in your time. It was like the worst <laughs> worst band you've ever heard. it was just you know and it was funny because like i'm sitting there thinking to myself wow this puts life all into perspective doesn't it you know just because you got to go play on a you know record with jerry reed and chet doesn't make you a superstar <laughs> which is a, which you is know, a great you lesson get, you just get right back humbled right back into the realities of life you know but you know after that, I stayed in New York, and and I don't know what I was thinking because, you know, Chet would he would just call me out of the blue one day. You know, I gave him a demo tape of my songs, and he went he just went crazy over it. He loved my demo tape, which is really funny to me because it was the furthest thing from what he did. I mean, it was. My, that demo tape I made at that time was very much rock and roll, like, you know, distorted, you know, blues rock, you know, it had some jazz, very jazzy elements to it. But it was rock and roll. It was like ACDC, you know, <laughs> Angus Young stuff, you know, at least to my ears at that time, you know, and he loved it. This was the stuff that he loved. It wasn't the, you know... When he first heard me play, he heard me as this blues rock guy. And so that's what he wanted on his record. Well, then when I, you know, that about a, probably a year went by after I did that record that I was still in New York. He came to New York to play at Carnegie Hall. And so he asked me to do that with him. So I played Carnegie Hall with him and the New York Pops. I did the bottom line with him and Jerry. And the then we did some. Line. What a cool place. Yeah. And then we did. Several of we did a couple of TV shows and then we did some, you know, other touring dates, just did a handful of gigs to kind of promote the record with just four guitars with me and him, 
me and Chet, Jerry, and uh, Paul Yandel, who was Chet's guitar player for years. And so, so I ended up doing that after the record. So, yeah, that was pretty amazing. But it, I was kind of a knucklehead because Chet would make hints to me and say, hey, you know, you ought to move down here to Nashville. You do pretty good. And I was I think in my head, man, God, I got all these bar mitzvahs and weddings. I don't know if I can give that up. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like what am I going to do for a living? And I get down there. Well, you know, sure enough, yeah. that, then my lease ran out and I moved up to Suffern, in New York. I moved in with my buddy, Matt King, He's a great piano player. I moved in with him and, and, uh, I remember I just got my last box into the house and I, and I told him, I said, that's it. I'm moving to Nashville. I'm going to move. I'll be here a couple of months and then I'm going to start going down there and trying to find a place to live. And I did. I mean, it couldn't have been the better idea. I mean, everything fell into place. I found an apartment for like $200 a month, you know, and, and, uh, the day I got to town, Chet picked me up, took me down to the musicians union and said, well, it's a right to work state, but if you're going to work for me, you're going to have to be in the union. And so, so he signed me up, paid my way into the union. And from then on, you know, I was working with him, but you know, it wasn't real super easy. It wasn't like I landed in Nashville and, you know, I had a gig with Chet Atkins. People were curious about me, but you know, you still have to prove yourself. You know, it took some time, you know, but I mean, I was working as, I was very, very lucky because I did hit the ground running, mm. you know, so that was a good thing. And, you know, I got to play on some records with some of the A-list guys right from the very start. And so, but still, you know, I was still very, very green and I had a lot to learn about playing in the studio and how to be a studio musician. And, you know, I could hang, but I, I wasn't like near at the level that these guys were, you know, I had a lot of experience doing overdubs, you know, but being like being, you know, tracking with the band and stuff, how to approach that and do all that, you know, it takes time to learn. You never stop learning how to do that. But, um, yeah. So that's kind of how that all went down. And, you know, and I've been here since 1993 and I've been working ever since. Pat, that's a beautiful, awesome, funny, Warm story, man. Thank you for sharing that. I have a bunch of questions. Yeah, okay. okay. So first of all, Robert Lee. Um, yeah, Robert Lee Castleman. He's Now, he's gone on to be a Grammy-winning songwriter. I introduced him to Alison Krauss years ago, and she went crazy over him like I knew she would because he's amazing. He's amazing. and He's, he's written a lot of her hit songs, and he's still writing for her. And and he's he's phenomenal he's like he's like from another world to me he's you know as a guitar player and a singer and songwriter his songs are just some of the best i've ever heard so you like sort of karmically paid him back yeah well i hope so because yeah, yeah he's you know i love him and you know i produced it he did a record called crazy as me on rounder records that i produced that's great. And, and that's a fantastic record. I'm very proud of that record. I still put it on every once in a blue moon. I listen to it and, you know, Allison's on it and Jerry Douglas and a lot of great people. And it's just, just fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Cause he was the one really who hooked you up. I mean, not, I mean, you want it. Yeah. I mean, that was really. Well, absolutely. Well, you know how he hooked me up more than anybody than any anything the way that he really hooked me up and this is a funny story too there was um when he did that spec deal down in muscle shoals uh the producer who wanted to do that for him wanted a certain guitar like session guitar player from nashville and he told the producer this this producer was a big name producer like huge big name producer who was going to produce him or else from West Virginia, he's, he's, uh, yeah, he spe- says what's on his mind. And, and so he, <laughs> he told the producer, he says, he, Robert Lee Castleman calls me Bergy, you know, Ber- Bergeson, he calls me Bergy. He's like, uh, 
the producer said, I want so-and-so on this record. He goes, he says, I ain't doing it if Bergie ain't doing it. That guy's a ham and egger. He called this, <laughs> this guy a ham and egger and said, uh, that guy's a ham and egger. I ain't doing it unless Bergie's doing it. That's where he stood up yeah. for me because if he hadn't said that, if he hadn't uh, – stuck his neck out and said, forget, I ain't doing your thing unless I can have the guitar player I want on this. You know, that's yeah, you, where, you that's where that. I owe him. Because if he hadn't said that to the producer, I never would have gone to Nashville and done that trip. And who knows if I ever met Chet it was all timing, hmm. you know? And so that was kind of, <laughs> that was a funny thing that happened. I was, and, and, you, and you're still buddies. Oh yeah, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other th uh, more questions. This uh, Defaria, you said. Yeah. Does he have a brother named Mike who's a guitar player? No, he's got a brother named John who's a guitar. Yeah, player. right. Out in John California. Lives in yes, yeah. you know John. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's great, yeah. and John's great guitar player. Yeah, I, I was. Yeah, I was. John was my hero when I was a kid. He was. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's still out in Los Angeles working. I got to get back with him now because. I we were in touch a while ago, and now that you've mentioned him, that's the universe telling me to call me to get back yeah. in touch with him. Yeah, John know? is John's a good friend of mine. Yeah, he's great. He was um, he was in uh, Miami Sound Miami Machine. Miami Sound Machine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, oh yeah. That's funny. It's such a small world in music, especially guitars, man. Oh yeah. I mean, there's no shortage of them, but it's a small world. Oh yeah. Um, okay, the other questions. You, you had that demo tape, that first song with RL. Was that a country song? The song was called Sneaking Around. You'll have to check it out. It's a really cool song. It's it's a thumb picking song in a minor in A minor. And Jerry and Ch Chet, I think they may have no, nah, maybe RL named the song. It just sounds like somebody sneaking around. That's why they why they uh named it that it's just got that kind of sound like somebody's sneaking around anyway it's um yeah that was the that was the song but were you it was that like even a normal style song you'd play back then see uh rl was a is a good thumb picker hmm. so he was a really good thumb picker and i wasn't a thumb picker when we met you know i was playing like jazz and rock you know so RL liked my jazz playing, and, and RL would write these thumb-picking tunes, and I'd play jazz licks over the top of them and make <laughs> melodies out of it. And so we had a we wrote some cool stuff. There's a tune on the record called Read My Licks called um, some, Somebody Loves Me Now. And that's one that uh, – um, no, that's not the one. That's not the one. I'm sorry. The one we wrote was called um, – Oh, shit, I'm forgetting the name of it. <laughs> Where I wrote the song, I forgot the name of it. I'll think of it in a second. But there's a there's one another tune on there that we wrote. It's got thumb picking, and then there's like this jazzy melody over the top. You know, that's kind of what we would do. And that demo tape that I sent to Chet that I told you that was the real rock and roll kind of demo tape. Chet ended up cutting one of the songs from that called "The Mountains of Illinois," and that's on "Read My Licks." Uh other question you you said that when he first when you were hanging out with chet and he would take you out to lunch take you to introduce you to a lot of people are you still friends with any of those people that you initially met through him oh yeah i am that's absolutely great. that's very absolutely. cool man so he yeah, really john Knowles and yeah you know i knew john before that he i knew him at uh national guitar workshop but yeah definitely i'm still friends with him that's great mm -hmm. when you flew back from your from that time that you were down in Nashville, you know your flight back to New York. So, like, what's going through your mind? Well, you know, I don't know. I just, I, yeah, I don't know what was going through my mind. I just, yeah, I was thrilled to get to do that. I wasn't looking forward to going back to New York. Yeah, and um, but. You know, I had a lot of good friends in New York, and you know, I was happy there in a lot of ways. But it was a struggle. I mean, you know, just very much a struggle to live there and just make a living as a musician. I don't know how anybody did it, to be honest with you. I don't know how people, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I think the time that I moved there in the 
I moved there in 83. You know, I think there was a heyday for session musicians and all that back in the 70s and 60s and all that. People could actually make a decent living and there was a lot of work and stuff. And when I was there, you know, things were really starting to peter out, yeah. you know, in a lot of ways. More more home studios were starting to happen and and yeah, there just wasn't as much of it. All the stuff that I did where I was making money was jingle work. And a lot of that was harmonica and guitar too, but and harmonica was big in jingle work back then, so I was doing a fair amount of that. But it was still wasn't enough to pay for my you know six hundred dollar a month parking tickets bill. <laughs> you know, yeah, I hear you. you. Know? <laughs> this isn't that's, that's a line item, <laughs> or getting my car you know from, you know picking up my car after it got towed you know and. Alternate side of the street park. Oh, jeez, yeah. yeah, just all <laughs> stuff that you had to deal with every day, and like dodging crack addicts and trying not to get mugged, and and <laughs> you know. Um, when you finally moved down here, you said that was two thousand and. I moved here. No, I moved here in ninety three in Nashville. Yeah, I'm assuming Chet was kind of a mentor of yours throughout the rest of that time. Oh, yeah, the whole time when he was alive. Yeah, I ended up working with him, you know, till he couldn't work anymore. I, and that was probably about seven years or so. Seven, eight years or something in the time from the time I started working with him. And uh, after I moved to Nashville, not long after that, he asked me to be in his band. So I started doing his his dates on the road. But there wasn't that many dates. We would only do about, I don't know, 30 dates a year. Mm. So in the times when he wasn't, when he wasn't uh, touring, I was touring with Shelby Lynn and Winona. And then I started working with Lyle Lovett. And, um, and I didn't get miss that many of his dates, even with all these other people I was touring with, I still got to do his dates and it would be great. Cause we would just go out for a weekend or for a few days or whatever at a time. And, uh, where we'd fly to California and do a few dates and come back or whatever, or fly somewhere. And so, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it just was being out there with him was the most fun ever because because Paul Yandel was there and he was absolutely the funniest person. And the two of them together, Chet and Paul together, the way they were with each other was just so funny. <laughs> they were, you know, Paul was his, you know, Chet was Paul's hero and Paul was an incredible thumb picker and guitar player himself. And, but you know, they were kind of like brothers. Those two, they just were so close, you know, they were giving each other shit all the time. And <laughs> it, I mean, it was just fun. Chet was just a fun guy to be around. He was funny. One of the funniest people I've ever met in my life. Just, you know, and just, he was always giving you shit, always trying to pull something over on you, you know, just, he would do stuff on the show where, you know, he would, you know, give you time for your solo and he'd tell you to yodel something or he would just put you on the spot somehow to try and embarrass you or just <laughs> mess with you all the time. He was, he was fun. So but, let me ask you this. If you had to, what would be the top lessons or takeaways that you got from Chet in three areas? Music, like playing music, um, the music business, and then just in life. Uh, well, playing, playing, uh, playing music, I, uh, I think for me, you know, at that time, like I said, you know, when I came to Nashville, I was still pretty green about a lot of things. You know, I'd never really been, you know, I played a lot of gigs by that time, but I'd never like been out like on a touring band to any kind of extent, you know, and to learn how to like play an actual show live and how to do it and how to be on stage and how to, you know, have your gear together and how to like, you know, you know, just be part of a show and be part of a touring act, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then also, you know, how to be tasteful and musical and, and, you know, playing what's appropriate and only what's appropriate and, you know, and, and, but at the same time, he, you know, he gave me a lot of freedom. I mean, it was tons of freedom because we, we would rehearse on occasion, but it wasn't that often we'd even rehearse. And we never knew what the set list was going to be. 
he never put a set list in front of the band. He would just call tunes on stage and you had to be there and ready to know what to do. And sometimes I would know the song or, you know, a lot of times funny thing about it was one of the first gigs that I did with him. He would just, he got up there without a set list and just started calling songs. It turned out a lot of the songs that he was playing were gigs that I learned or were songs that I learned on wedding gigs. (laughs) So I'm thinking like, wow, I know that song and I know it in that key, you know, and, you know, so I thought, you know, well, that's cool. The wedding gigs were actually, actually paid off in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, he wasn't playing Paula Abdul or anything like that, but you know, he was playing jazz standards and stuff like that and doing them in his way. But I learned those, a lot of those tunes in college too, but, but, you know, as far as, you know, musically, you know, he would, you know, when we were in the studio working, like I would be working on a solo. He'd have me like play a solo on something and I'd be sitting there playing through and I'd do several takes and he'd go and I might run into a wall, you know, start running into a wall. Like, what do I do now? And, he, and he'd go, well, whistle something or sing something in your head and play that or play something around the melody. You know, he was always trying to, you know, make sure that we that you honored the melody and honored the song. And, um, and I also noticed from him and learned from him about here, here was a guy who was, you know, ran RCA records there and, you know, signed everybody from, you know, Dolly Parton and Willie Nelson and all these people. He knew what a good song was. He knew what a good song was and he had the track record to prove it. And you could tell just by being around him, like, you know, the kinds of things that he liked and didn't like you know, and the kind of music that he listened to. And, and, you know, when I started playing music, you know, I spent all those years playing jazz and I'm the biggest jazz fan, but you know, I think that a lot of jazz, this is it to me, a lot of it is, I like the stuff that, you know, the older I get, the, the, the jazz I like is the jazz that entertains people the jazz that draws people in and doesn't go too over their head. And, you know, I like the real swing and stuff, you know, I mean, I've my taste pretty much, I like a lot of modern players, but my taste kind of ends after, you know, 1965 after that, you know, I like, I mean, it's, I like bebop and swing and all that stuff. But I think, you know, Chet just, he just, if it got too dissonant and too out there, it just, he just thought it was pointless. Mm. You know, and I don't think it's pointless, but I just really learned a lot from him about the guy had a lot of success because he played music that, you know, he played songs and songs with melodies and stuff that people could could uh, latch on to and, you know, draw people in. And, you know, he had huge crowds at his gigs and he people absolutely loved him because of that. And I I think I learned a lot of that from him in in a way, too. Um, he said, you know, he liked to keep things close to the ground, you know, keep the music close to the ground, you know, we're, you know, meaning down to earth, you know, where yeah. people, you know, it's, it's, you know, music isn't always, you know, for me being a younger musician, it was all about playing for the other musicians and for the jazz fans. When, in, when in fact, you know, after I started playing with Chet, I started to learn that no, it's just for, you know, it's, you know, your mom has to dig what you do or your, you know your kids got to like it or whatever, you know, you got to be able to, to appeal to, you know, every, all walks of life, you know? And so Chet was like that kind of guy. And I, that's kind of one of the things I learned from him about life and stuff, you know? And I remember there was one day we're driving in the car and we were up there. uh, I remember we were in up there music row and we were going by the, going through the roundabout there where the naked statue is. That's what they call it in Nashville, the naked statue. It's some piece of artwork there in the right there at the end of music row. And it's a bunch of naked people frolicking. And uh, I know there's an artist, but if you're from Nashville, it's, it's actually referred to as the naked statue. But anyway, we we're going is that around like one music. <laughs> is that like in front of one music row or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. I know it. I know it. Yeah. 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 So we're going through the roundabout there and somebody kind of cut him off when we were driving. And he said, he goes, you know, I'm not going to get mad at that guy. He's, he's got to work for a living and you know, I get to play music and, and, and he's probably having a rough day and you know, 
And I was like, wow, that's really cool, you know. Um, so he was kind of like a, a mellow, zen-like sort of guy? Uh, yeah, I suppose like you could say that. Yeah, he... Well, I mean, yeah. it, it didn't, from, from everything you're saying, he sounded like very caring and nurturing as opposed to, you know, the other kind of teacher, which is God could be caring, but he's a little rough around the edges about it. Oh, no, he could be rough around the edges. Mm. Oh, he could definitely be rough around. He was both. He yeah. was both things. Yeah. You know, he was definitely both things. Like I said, you know, he was kind of a mischievous guy and he was always like pulling stuff over it, kind of pull something over with on you on the gig and always goofing and stuff like that. But. No, he's very much a nurturing guy. I mean, you know, he helped me like like you just wouldn't believe him and his whole family. I mean, they just really helped me when I moved here. And I just have so much fond memories of it. You know, I'd, I'd go over to his house on Sunday afternoons. I mean, I'd spend the entire day at his house. We'd go to lunch and I'd be I'd be there till eight, nine o'clock at night. We'd have dinner with with his, with Leona and hang out all day. He'd play me records. We'd sit there and he would put pickups in his guitar and show me how to wire pickups. And and um, I mean, we did that many times where I would just go over and just hang out with him. He would take me to lunch all the time and uh, take me to Hillwood Country Club with the family and go eat and stuff. It was just great. That's good. It's nice yeah. that you had a guy looking out for you like that. that oh, no, it, he really he really took difference. me under his wing. He really took me under his wing and, and tried to help me. And I just, yeah, I just am so grateful to him for that. It was just, it was an amazing time for me. Talk about a couple of other people that you worked with. And I was curious how you, you know, if how you got the gig and if you had a cool story or interesting story about working with them, Michael McDonald. Oh, I, I, uh, yeah, I was really lucky to get to, to do some stuff with Michael McDonald. Like I got to do some sessions with them and, um, we wrote a song together that Alison Krauss recorded. That was a real thrill for me. You know, I wrote the music and he wrote the lyrics and that was just a real thrill to get to do that with them. But I met him through Chet Atkins. We used to do, uh, with Chet, we used to do an every Monday night at a local place in Nashville called the Cafe Milano back in the 90s for a couple of years. And every Monday we would have, you know, the who's who of of country music. And, you know, we had Michael McDonald. We'd have, you know, we had uh, Peter Frampton one weekend and we'd have Johnny Cash one weekend. We'd have, you know, you name it. We had, you know, Mark Knopfler. We'd have him as a guest, you know, and... And so I got to meet all these great people. I met him through Chet years ago. And uh, so that's how I knew him. So and then since then, you know, I'd gotten to do, you know, occasionally I'd get to do something with him, a session or something. And and um, and one time we got to do a soundstage, the TV show, which was great because it was he was doing his Motown show. And he had, a, you know, some stuff that he did with Billy Preston. Oh, wow. So I got to play on that. You know, Stevie Wonder played on the record, and Stevie couldn't make the uh, show, so I got to be the harmonica player and sit in for Stevie, which was a pretty pretty awesome thing. <laughs> so you got to sit in for Stevie and play with well, Billy Preston and Michael McDonald? Yes. Wow, yes. what a great opportunity. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a video of it on YouTube somewhere of us wow. doing it. We, we so did. Cool. There was there was a tune that we did. I was made to love her, where I got to be the harmonica player, and so he featured me on that, which was cool. And you know, so I got to do stuff with him occasionally. And so, yeah, he's super cool. And how about your experience with Le Brers? That was an incredible time. That was really really incredible. That that just lasted a couple of years. Um, uh, yeah, it was just amazing. Just amazing. And that was like another sort of thing that happened where I would have never thought I would have gotten to be in that situation. Um, Jack Pearson has been a friend of mine for 25 years. You know, we've known each other a long time. I met him when I first moved to Nashville. And one day I ran into him and he said, hey, you know, uh, Butch Trucks called me and wants to put together this band. I was trying to think of another guitar player and you're 
perfect guy and love to do it. And we play great together. And I think it would be really fun. And I said, Oh, of course, Jack would, you know, I'd do that in a second, you know, thinking in my mind, like, Oh yeah, that'll never happen in a million years. <laughs> you know? And, and then they were, you know, he was talking about how, you know, Butch wanted to get the Almond brothers back. And would I do it if it was the Almond brothers? And I'm like, yeah, you know, that'll never happen. But, but, say yeah, no. sure. Say no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Jack, you know, that, you know, well, it turns out, you know, a couple months later, they call me and we do, we're going to start rehearsing. And so we went to Macon, Georgia and did a couple of days of rehearsal. And yeah, I mean, it was just unbelievable. The rehearsal was just a jam. It was just one big, long jam. We didn't rehearse anything. I think <laughs> we just learned the songs and we jam. I wish we would have recorded the rehearsal. It was unbelievable how fun it was. And so, you know, everybody, I mean, just, you know, to get to play in a band with J-Mo and Bush Trucks and O'Teal Burbridge and and uh, Bruce Katz and Lamar Williams and Mark Kinonis and all those guys, um, it was unbelievable. It was just a, an incredible experience. You know, and after that rehearsal, where everybody's just laughing and having a great time and just was great so we did we did a little touring and we did some festivals and you were down here and, uh, i think you were down here in tampa i'm pretty sure no we never got to florida no okay. oh no we were yeah i'm sorry we did wani festival that was in okay. florida yeah that was up in C central florida, north like florida. lake yeah. city or something live oak live oak north, yeah yeah north yeah we did that but yeah so yeah it was an amazing experience i mean it was just you know we played a few original songs and mostly almond brothers tunes and we just took it out, man. We just, yeah, there's a lot of video of it you can find. You know, there was some great nights, you know, just really great. And we just, just, it was completely different every single night. And Butch and JMO were very excited about it because it was, you know, they were saying how much they enjoyed it. And, and, uh, yeah, it was a blast. And then I got a phone call like a year ago, January from Jack. Jack Pearson called me at like 11 o'clock at night. And I'm like, why is he calling me so late? You know, and he told me that Butch had, had killed himself, died. And that was just a blow. I mean, serious blow. It was just, we were having so much fun. And, um, yeah, it was just a, so sad to hear that he, you know, was so, such a bad way that that would happen, you know, really feel f for him and his family. But, that that's that was it and then we did some dates last year to kind of end our contract and we got Dwayne trucks from uh, Derek trucks brother with from widespread panic he mm. came and played drums with us and, and so that was the end of that and uh, <clears throat> was that the first time you'd played with two drummers no no I mean when I was in high school I played in a you know in a rock band called the blues agency and we had two drummers in that band that's a cool name yeah, the blues. Agency. Well, the reason, well, the reason it was the blues agency was because we used to rehearse at the Batavia. I'm from Batavia, Illinois, which is outside of Chicago. We rehearsed in the Batavia News Agency. Ah, oh, that's clever. So, yeah, the blues um, the, our, our singer's mom uh, ran the news <laughs> agency, so we got a place to big garage to rehearse in. News agency is that like a candy store or a newspaper store? No, it was a news agency <laughs> where they. You know, all the newspapers came to where you'd, you know, stuff the papers together to take them to all the stores and, you know, you'd put them in the trucks and okay. deliver all the newspapers to the local businesses. Okay, I got you. They didn't have that in New York. They they just give them to the kids that deliver the papers and make them stuff them. And I'm not, yeah. I'm not kidding you. Yeah, that's what they did. I never heard of yeah. that. The only time I heard news, at my wife's from the UK and they call like candy stores news agents there. That's why I thought you were talking about. Oh, okay. No. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, hey, are you working on anything now that you're excited about? Um, gosh, let me look at my schedule. <laughs> it's <laughs> different. It's different all the time. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing lots of different. I mean, my life is different constantly. You know, I'm still doing. You know, I've got a. I just got. I've got session work coming up. And I'm excited about everything I'm doing, to be honest with you. Um, I'm doing a Merle Travis tribute next Wednesday night on April 18th at the City Winery in Nashville with Steve Warner and Tommy Emanuel 
and Jack Pearson and myself and then a whole bunch of other oh great Oh, my God. Players. It's, it's like <laughs> That's a crazy. To Earl Travis. So we've got, like, you know, Eddie Pennington from, from uh, Kentucky and Rory Hoffman and all these amazing musicians are all going to be there. Uh, Parker Hastings from Kentucky, young guitar player who plays thumb style. He's amazing. So yeah, we're all going to like do Muriel Travis tunes and it's going to be, I don't know, there's 12, 15 guitar players on the show. And so it's going to be a blast. It's just a whole night of, of, of guitar. And it's April 18th at the city winery. And then I'm going to be, uh, you know, I'm still doing Woolworths, Woolworths on fifth on, uh, Friday nights from seven to nine with Charles Wig Walker soul legend charles wig walker and we also do acme feed and seed from eleven thirty a.m to 2 2 30 p.m for the soul brunch with charles wig walker on saturdays Dude, do you and do that I, all the time because i'll be i'm gonna come up for now. every weekend for the most whenever i'm in town i'm playing a jam festival on uh, april 28th with jack pearson at the in uh, hainville georgia outside of macon it's so called the hainville jam fest God, I'd love to see you and Jack play together. That I'm coming yeah. up for Nam. I'd love to. I wonder if you guys will be playing together then. We play a lot together. Yeah, I, when I do my gigs, you know, I'll call him. He'll come down, sit in, and play, and vice and vice versa. We'll do stuff. I'm going to do a record with John Paul White uh, from the Civil Wars. He's doing a solo record. I'm doing that, and May, and then just lots of different gigs. Annie and I, Annie Selleck, my wife and I, are going to be. In California, um, uh, April, I mean, sorry, May 17, 18, 19, 20, we're doing the Lord of the Strings um, concert series. Uh, in sev- we'll be in um, Dana Point on the 18th. The 19th will be in Mission Viejo. And the 20th of May, we are in Costa Mesa. And then I'll be in Bakersfield at the Crystal Palace. I'm going to maybe play a couple of songs with Steve Warner. We're going to do some stuff there at the, the uh, crystal palace. He's got a show there that night. And we talked about playing some with him there for that. And so we'll be there on May 17th. And um, yeah, but it's, you know, it's different all the time. It's just constantly changing as far as like stuff, you know, it's just all kinds of sessions for different people and that kind of thing. And a lot of, you know, a lot of that's harmonica too. And guitar. But, do, you, uh, do you like playing one over the other, or is it, is it just a good break to for well, each one? You know, harmonica is a is a whole lot le- less uh, of a pain in the ass. You know, because it's portable. I walk in with one bag, <laughs> yeah. you know, and a shitload of harmonicas, and like, what key is it in, and count it off, and you know, it's. I like doing harmonica because it's you get to uh, – it's a lot easier in, in a lot of ways because with the guitar, you know, it's like, well, you go in as a guitar player in a session, and a lot of times the sessions I do, they want me to play <coughs> electric, acoustic, and nylon string. Oh, wow. <coughs> Excuse me. Pardon me. So I'm doing, you know, all three things, you know, so I got pedals, you know, you got gear to deal with. You got, you got three a different, different amps. Sound. Yeah, all these sounds you got to mess with, and you know, and, and there's so many things, there's so many factors involved when you go to do guitar. For me, harmonica is just much easier to do because it's like, okay, you want harmonica? This is a harmonica. This is what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. You know, nobody's going to say, "Hey, can you make that harmonica sound more like a, you know, yeah, you know, turn up the mid range on your harmonica?" Yes, or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like you know, guitar. You got slide guitar. You got. You know, you name it. You got a whammy bar. You got all these damn, you know, contraptions to deal with when you're playing guitar. And that's the, you know, the, that's the blessing and the curse, yeah. you know. Yeah. You're, so. you're originally from Chicago. What, what was your childhood like growing up out there? Oh, I had an incredible childhood. Um, I'm one of six kids. And mom and dad got us all into music. So yeah, we were all, we all played something, you know, and I started on drums. I was, I thought I was going to be a drummer. I played from third grade till I was, <coughs> I think the last gig, real drums gig I did was with a Dixieland band at University of Illinois. Oh, so you played quite a long time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
I can still sit down and play boom, boom, bap. You know, I can't really swing or play jazz. You know, I could do it on the ride cymbal and hi hat, but anything else, I just can't do it. You know, but I sound about as good as I did when I quit playing. And uh, but I that's that was what I did. You know, and then I was doing guitar and drums at the same time for a while. You know, I've heard from a number of people that the the best guitar players are guys who started as drummers or have a very thick and uh, drum history behind them, you know. Do, do you know like uh, Jim Oblon? Yeah, I just talked to him yesterday. Yeah, he's yep. a, he's a you know, great guitar player and he's a drummer. I love Jim Oblon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's great. He's one of my favorite guys around here. Yeah. Yeah, he's a fantastic musician. Um yeah, I think, you know, Tommy Emmanuel still plays drums. As a matter of fact, we've done gigs together where he plays drums. That's <laughs> wild. A, he's great. He's great. Yeah. Yeah. Tommy is a, you know, Tommy can play the drums and, um, yeah, I mean, and you listen to him play and he's the, you know, he's the groovinest cat you'll ever mm-hmm. hear in your life. You know, just amazing time and, and feel and, you know, rhythm. And it's just, he's incredible. That's, I but, yeah, I that. think it's interesting. Oh Yeah. I think that definitely has helped him. He'd probably say that too, that that has helped his guitar playing, but you know, you know, rhythm is, you know, that's really the essence of, of music to me, because, you know, you think about, you know, there's 12 notes, you know, and even chords that that you can make, they've all been used, you know, and probably just about any kind of chord sequence you can possibly name. I mean, you know, you can, with 12 notes, the amount of harmony that you can do, it's, you know, pretty infinite as well, but, you know, but as far as like rhythmic variety, that is quite infinite. Yeah. I mean, that there is like, it's even more so, I mean, as far as like the amount of different rhythms that you can play in, in, and so, <clears throat> you know, the, the, I think, uh, where drums can inform your guitar playing is in the, you know, groove and feel And, you know, why is it that 12 different drummers can sit down and play the same groove, but, but some drummers have a feel. It's not what they're playing. Is it, what does it feel like? It's all the little inflections and all the little, you know, all the little inflections that you do with, with your hands and, you know, and the dance that you do with your hands when you play. And it's the same thing with guitar. It's in the inflection. And, you know, the loud and soft and the dynamics of it, you know, like, why is it that, you know, three, four, five guys can play the same thing on the guitar, but one guy's got the feel. It's the way he makes it feel like if a guy plays a shuffle, you know, a shuffle isn't, you know, but, 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 there's a way that you make it swing. And there really is, you know, certain ways that, you know, you know, guys can some guys just got the feel and they have, they have a, a understanding of it, a deeper understanding of it than I think other people do, you know, and I think drums can, in, can inform that, you know, I guess that would be my answer. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, you've been in this for a long time. If you had to look back and give your younger self, younger Pat Bergeson, advice what would you have told yourself that you wish you would have known back then oh i probably would have said don't smoke cigarettes <laughs> um uh you don't smoke now right no i quit a long time ago but um i don't know advice from younger self to younger oh, self God. yeah yeah, geez, I don't even know. Be honest with you, I, I I don't know how to answer that because I don't really. I had a lot of fun my in my younger self. You know, I did spend a lot of time practicing music hmm. when I was younger. I mean, I spent I was just eating up with it. You know, I spent a lot of time. You know, eight hours a day with the guitar in my hand. You know, at certain times of my life. You know, and I don't know, sometimes I think, well, maybe I should have had more of a social life. But then but then I think about it. I'm like, nah, you know, I did the right thing. You know, I just, you know, 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know how I would answer that, really, to tell you the truth, Craig. You know, sense. I do tell young students now, you know, if I have a younger student, I do tell them, you know, uh, I stress to them very much how much they should be practicing now, you know, when they're young, you know, because when they get older, they're not going to have as much time, you know, and no telling what you're going to do in your life. But if you really get eaten up with it and really spend a lot of time, you know, working on your instrument when you're, you know, a teenager into your, you know, till your mid thirties or whatever, you know, that's something that I really like to stress to younger people. Talk about gear for a few minutes. What do you, what is your go to guitar right now? My go to guitar, you know, the one that I go to all the time is still the one that I've had since 1989. Just green parts guitar Stratocaster. I still play that thing all the time. You know, it's the one I always go to because, you know, I tell people this all the time. You know, I can drop that guitar on the ground, and and it's still in tune. Is that a fa- is that a Fender? Strat- no, it's parts. It's a Warmoth body, and oh, it's a wow. ESP neck. And a guy named Daryl Gilbert in New York built it for me back in the late '80s, early '90s. And um, it had a real skinny Tom Anderson neck on it when I first got it, but that neck went bad because the wood was too green or something. But it's it's yeah, it's that's the guitar I use. The frets are like completely worn out on it right now. It's it's actually really really going to need new frets, but I'm kind of afraid to put them on there because mm. I don't want it to get I don't want it to feel too weird. But that guitar is the guitar I've had that it's had twenty different pickup combinations and pick guards and everything. It's a green body with a rosewood neck and um, with a white toilet seat pick guard and um, <laughs> toilet seat and uh, that's it. Yeah, that's the one I play. What would be like number two and three? Um, I had a I have a '67 Esquire that I put a neck pickup in it, so it's like a Tele. It's a '67 mm. like blonde one with a maple neck. I played that for quite a while. I got way into that one, and then uh, yes, and now I haven't played it. I went back to the Green Strat, and um, th- that one I played a lot, but. Tell you the truth, for the electric guitar, this is the one I go to if I'm going to play a live gig. It's that Green Strat. You know, I have some hollow bodies. I've got some vintage guitars and stuff. But a lot of that stuff I just use on sessions. When I'm taking out a guitar, I just really know, need to know that I have something that I just just think is just so reliable. You know, and it's it's nothing. It's not like a real lightweight guitar or anything. It's not a, you know, it's it's just like an old friend, you know how that yeah, is. I sure do. You know, that's nice. It's like Brent Mason with his gray <laughs> telly or Larry Carlton with his 68, you know, 335 or whatever. It's mm. or Pat Metheny with his 175. You know, they got that one guitar and it's like, they've had it since they were kids. And it's like, yeah, you don't, it's the fun, you know, the funny thing about this whole guitar playing business, I'm not into guitars. You know, I could give a shit about guitars. I, I mean, it's I'm, I'm more into fishing poles than I am guitars or, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm just not. I mean, I have friends who are way into them, and I get it. I mean, I totally get why you could be into it, and they're they're super cool things, you know. But to me, I don't know. I just, does it sound good? And can I drop it on the ground in order? You know? <laughs> because I will drop it on the ground or it'll fall over. I'll bang the neck against the wall and, you know, and is, is the neck going to get warped or is it, you know, or is it going to, you know, neck going to move every winter so much that I can't even play it or whatever. And I got to take it to the shop or, you know, I don't really care about all that stuff. I just... I just want one guitar that works really well. But, you know, for recording sessions, you got to have the different sounds. I have found that, you know, and I bring less and less guitars to recording sessions than I used to, you know, now because, you know, probably I'd say about seven out of 10 times I go to do a recording session and I play, you know, I'll bring 12 guitars and I'll play two. Okay. You know, most of the time, you know, so. Yeah. So it, what I was going to say was that, you know, having lots of guitars, which I do, you know, but 
you know, it kind of becomes a burden after a while where you just like walk into the room with all these guitars. You're like, damn, I haven't took that one out of the case in three years or whatever. And and then you just start to be like, yeah, but I just want to hold on to it because it plays so well in tune, you know, and that's the other thing I would, I would definitely say, what does the guitar feel like? You know, my criteria for a good guitar is what does the neck feel like? Is it easy to play? Is it comfortable to wear? You know, do the pickups sound good? But mainly the first, very first thing would be how well is it, is it intonate? You know, does it play well in tune? And, um, that's really it for me. That's the main thing. I don't care if it's the coolest guitar you ever seen in your life. If it doesn't play, it doesn't intonate well, it's completely worthless yeah. to me. Jack is and, pretty uh, utilitarian about guitars. You know, yeah, he's, I, he's, he's, he's yeah. pretty like very practical about guitars. Yeah. Jack is very practical. Like Jack plays the, you know, hundred dollar Squire bullet strap, you right. know, and I get why he likes those guitars. Cause they're great. Yeah. If you find the good one, like he, he, he said, you know, you got to pick through them till you find the right one. Yeah. And I've played the ones that he has. I'm like, I'd buy one of these in a second. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with this guitar. Yeah. And I'm the same way. I'm very utilitarian about it. Yeah. Well, because he- I do have a good story, a good Chet Atkins story about yeah. a guitar. He did give me, I have, I have a handful of his guitars that I got from him, but there's one particular guitar, um, that, when I first moved to town, I told Chet that I didn't have a really good acoustic. I'd like to get a real good acoustic guitar, you know, another good acoustic. And shortly thereafter, I was over with hanging out with him. We went to lunch or something. And after lunch, I was about to leave. And his secretary said to me, hey, don't forget your guitar before you leave. I go, what guitar? She said, it's over there behind the couch. And I walk behind the couch, and there's this Gibson J30. It was wow. Chet's road guitar that he used through the '80s, and and I, you know, up until I met he met me, he probably had it for about ten years or so. And um, and it turns out to it's just an incredible guitar. I mean, I use it on every session that I play acoustic guitar, and it's the only one I play most of the time. Man, it what sounds a gift. Interesting. Engineers love it too. It's just an incredible sounding guitar. It records really well. And uh, so she goes, Don't forget your guitar. So I go over to pick, get the guitar, and Chet's walking up the stairs. He didn't want me to make a big fuss over it. Yeah. He didn't want to hang around for me to make a big fuss. And he, he took a picture of himself holding the guitar and put it in the case. And with a note on the back said, To Pat with my Gibson J30. You know, that's so cool, so, man. Yeah, it was very cool. Was what very- a, you know, that's a real neat yeah. thing, man. Yeah. Music. If I asked you to pick your top three Desert Island discs, what would be, what, knowing in no particular order and knowing this could change tomorrow, what, what would be your knee jerk reaction to your picks right now? Oh, God. Desert Island. Well, that question actually, actually, what you're, saying your question is first you're you're implying that somehow i may get like be in a boat somewhere and like you know maybe like the ss minnow you know like From gilligan's, gilligan's island, island. <laughs> and i may like crash somewhere in the middle of some island and then be like so then i would have to that would also assume that i would have to have some kind of you know walkman or uh you know cd player with me after i crashed and so I'm just kidding, Craig. Anyway, <laughs> I'm, saying, I'm saying, man, this guy is super anal. <laughs> um, um, like, man, even my wife wouldn't have worked that out that light. And she's like, so, you know, speck of dust on the floor, whoosh, gone. <laughs> this would assume that I would have a waterproof, um, <laughs> a waterproof uh, Walkman. Yes, on. yes. No, I'm just kidding. And a bomb um, made out of coconuts. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. So I don't know, man. I don't know. Um, gosh, I don't know. That's it's. God, what do I? What would I do? What would I want? I would just. It would probably be some jazz records, you know. Um, I would get tired of. I'd probably get tired of it. Depends on how long I'm stranded. Too. How long am I going to be stranded, Craig? 
Oh, I don't know. That's you know we have a separate interview for that one. We, then we talk. No, only- we we deconstruct the desert island process in part yeah. two of the interview, Pat. Yeah, if I'm going to be stranded for months at a time, I got to have some jazz because then I can listen to it over and over and try to learn something. You know, <laughs> keep my mind active. But if it's you know if it's like just a couple of days, then I could have some rock and roll records, and then I would you know. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, I don't know. Um. Uh. Probably some some jazz records. That's what I'd want to have. Anything, anything by you know some some. Uh, um, probably some bebop records, like Charlie Parker and, or something. Yeah, probably well, maybe like Sonny Rollins and and um, Clifford Brown and Lee Morgan and and some Art Blakey records and. Uh, but yeah, you know I'm. I love, you know, I mean, I grew up on, you know, Skinner and Led Zeppelin and Santana and, you know, yeah. Dixie Dregs, you know, Steve Morris. There, There's a guy who's the he's the baddest cat for rock and roll guitar. He's still to me is the top. He's the top dog. They're touring now. I'm still, there's yeah, I know. I heard that the original band is touring and I'd love to go see a show, but I don't see that they're coming here to Nashville. But yeah, I saw them many times back in the 70s when I was in high school. Mm. Yeah, they were just, he's still like the, I, I still haven't heard a guy who plays with as much nutsack as that guy does. Oh, really? Yeah, I haven't. I mean, there's a lot of great players out there, but it's for for like rock and roll, you know, electric guitar, that guy, he's the shit to me still. Maybe one of his records I'd have with me. Now, does it matter if it's the temperature? What's that? No, I'm just messing with you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> just, give, just giving you back a little shit. <laughs> uh, hey man, what's what's something that you've learned about yourself along this journey? Um. Well, I would say, as far as like being a musician, what I have learned is, you know, being a musician is a leap of faith. That's what it is. Um, you know, I remember, you know, I, after, you know, all through high school and, you know, even during college, you know, I worked as a land surveyor. You know, my dad's an engineer, civil engineer. So I surveyed, you know, I was a guy standing out there with a the transit and the, you know, big long pole, you know, in the middle of the road. I was one of those guys. And, you know, I did that for years. And after I got out of college, you know, I still had to work a regular job for a few years before I got a, you know, before I could quit and do music full time. And, um, you know, that was a leap of faith. You know, that was just like, you know, just jumping in there and taking that risk and doing it. You know, I think that's one of the things that I, you know, I learned that, you know, through this whole time of doing this, you know, it's always a, you know, every week, you know, I'll go into the year sometimes, you know, I mean, I have things planned out through the year, but you know, there's a lot of stuff time where it's not planned out yeah. and stuff. It's just, I'm always getting called to, to do stuff. And so that is, you know, you could call that a God thing or whatever you would want to say, you know, um, to me, that's, that's something that I've learned that, you know, that is a real thing, you know, praying for things is, is, you know, does may have results. And, um, and I'm not saying that from a Christian perspective at all. I'm just saying, um, uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that <laughs> it's uh, it's a weird world today. You have to say something and then disclaimer it and then, like, it's, <laughs> and then disclaim the disclaimer because <laughs> right. you don't want to offend yeah. anybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's just, you know, I am very grateful for that, for all of that, mm-hmm. you know, that like my life is, you know, I've gotten to do what I've, what I want to do and I'm still doing what I like to do. And, and I'm enjoying it very much and I can't ask for anything more than that. Um, but what is this all taught you about I, you? I've, I've just learned, I guess, to answer your question, I've learned to be grateful for, for what I have. And, uh, um, and I'm grateful for, you know, all the musicians that I get to meet and all the stuff and just, you know, for just people calling me to, to, you know, asking me to, 
to work for them. You sure. know, I'm just very happy to do it. And um, that's just a great thing. You know, it's my observation that guys that um, one of the the traits that all the, the guys have who work a lot is that they realize they are in the service business. Mm-hmm. And I Absolutely, yeah. you're in the service business. Mm-hmm. And I've spoken to guys at all levels of the spectrum, sidemen. And no matter what level they are, the guys that are working all the time, they have exactly, you know, they're grateful for the work and they realize it's not about them and they're in their employer, their job is for whoever their employer is at that particular time to serve the songs or the interests or wants of, of that person. That's exactly uh, right. It's, yeah. It's a very uh, readily apparent trait in, in, in all the successful people. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's like, you know, and you know, that's like when I told you when I, I was real green when I moved to Nashville, you know, you know, I had a lot of hot licks and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, that's, you know, the, as time goes on, you start to realize, well, that, that ain't that ain't nothing. You know, that ain't no part of nothing. You right. know, it, it, it's really cool, but it's like simplicity is the key, you know. And, you know, how do you make somebody else sound good and how do you serve what they do? And, and the older you get, you get to where you can size up that situation much quicker. Mm. You know, you hear a song and you go, oh, yeah, this just needs a little bit of that, and a little bit of this. And, you know, and, you know, keep your ears open and, and you know, be courteous and, you know, and, you know, don't be a dick. Like, Don't be a dick. Yeah, that's a don't, very don't be a dick. Like, simple just, mantra. Yeah, yeah, no, but just, you know, yeah, you are in the service business. You're there for them. You know, they hired you. They are paying you. Don't forget that. Yeah. And, uh. And be glad, you know, and I am glad. Um, and I enjoy it. I do enjoy it. What do you like most about yourself? That's always a tough question. About myself? Yeah. Well, you know what? I have to say, you know, just being that, just being grateful for stuff. You know, I have to I remind myself just to be grateful for what I have. You know, I've, you know, I've got a lot of, lot to be grateful for. And, um, you know, I got to work with a lot of great musicians, and and um, yeah, it's just it's a good life. It's a real good life. But you know, like I would say, a like about myself, um, yeah, I just uh, I don't know. I don't. I, I you know, I can. I guess to answer that question, I can think about what the way I used to be and the way I am now. You know, like may, maybe I. You know, I've certainly, um, I must certainly, I think a lot more easygoing about things than I used to be. Hmm. And that's served me well. It, has that, has any of that been deliberate or is that a natural for you anyway? Has that been just a natural part of aging? I don't know. I think it's part, you know, it's probably a natural part of aging. I would hope it would be a natural part of aging. Hmm. Um, you know, thinking of it that way would, you know, would, would assume that hopefully I'm smart enough to know how to like learn from my mistakes. Hmm. And, um, yeah. Best childhood memory. Best childhood memory. Oh, probably some of my best childhood memories are my, are fishing trips with my dad and my brothers. Up in Wisconsin and, you know, Minnesota and our family fishing trips with, you know, with, we would go with the whole family and we would also go with my dad and brothers in fall and spring. I'm still doing that with my dad and brothers. We're doing that in May. That's cool, man. Going up to, we go to Hayward, Wisconsin and fish for crappies and muskies and muskies. Wall- that's what you guys have. Walleyes and yeah. northern pike and yeah, pike yeah. and muskies. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be doing that in that's May. Awesome. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Tell me something about yourself people would either be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. Okay. You know, here, this was a, this is a good one. Funny you should ask that. I collect cone top beer cans. What, what is a cone top beer Some can? of my close buddies know that, but most people don't. A cone top beer can is a 
they made beer cans. It was a fad. Like it started as a fad, like in the late sixties, early seventies. And I started collecting when I was a little kid and, um, a cone top beer can, they look like those STP oil cans or whatever. Mm. They've got like a conical top on them. When they first started making, you know, putting beer in cans, um, they, uh, you can look up cone top beer can online and it'll show you what they look like. But that's how beer used to come. It looks like a can with a bottle top. They would put a bottle cap on, on the top of the little, you, you know, know what I'm talking about? I've you know never seen oil cans. I know the ST. I've never seen yeah. them in my life. I don't well, think they had those in the Northeast. Yeah, they're extremely rare and very valuable. No, um, they're like baseball cards. Now they're like very hard to find, you know, guys like plumbers will be like knocking out a wall in somebody's house and like find one, like from the 1930s and, and, uh, you know, thing will be worth, you know, tons of money, you know, and somebody who can buy their kids way into college with one of those things. <laughs> wow. That is but, interesting. Um, yeah. So I collect old, old cone top beer cans. That's a very odd thing. You know, as a matter of fact, I'll go ahead and say I'm more into those than I am guitars. It's all right, man. Doesn't make you a bad <laughs> Not person. Playing guitar though. Playing yeah. guitar is a different story. <laughs> Clearly. Mm. Clearly. Uh most important person in your life. Oh, that would be that would definitely be my family. Most pers- important, like right off the top of my head, be Annie, my wife. How long are you guys been married? We'll be married ten years on May thirty first. Hey man, congratulations. Good for mm-hmm. you. Mm hmm. Congrats. My son Sam is is very important to do. I've got an eighteen year old son, and but then you know that it would I would have to say all of my family. Anything keep you up at night? Um, yeah, too much coffee. <laughs> Stop after three. That's what I did. <laughs> too much coffee and yeah, and you know, don't eat sauerkraut before bed. <laughs> is that what your wife tells you? Is that yours? No, I'm just <laughs> I don't. Eat, I don't eat sauerkraut. Most important thing your dad taught you? Uh probably most important thing your dad taught me. Um, your know, dad taught me about nature, about being out in nature, and how important it is. You know how important it is to be outside, and um, I would say that with that, you know, and taught me about fishing. Fishing is that fun. Thing. Yeah. How about your mom? Most important thing your mom taught you? Mom, mom, you know, mom's a very loving person. I would say, you know, taught us how to love each other and be, you know, good to each other. Has your life been different than what you'd imagined or close to what you'd imagined? You know, I didn't imagine anything. I didn't imagine one single thing. You know, I probably, you know, um, I guess, you know, like if you would say imagine from like when I was a little kid, you mean? I don't, I don't know. I don't, you know, when I ask these questions, I really don't have any uh, expectations. But you know, tell you the truth, you know, I, I never really imagined anything. You know, I, um, I've really, you know, my, my goals, you know, have always been to be as, you know, good of a musician as I can be. You know, to be, um, and like what you're talking about, um, you know, being a sideman and being in the service business, you know, I've always, that's always been important to me, like to be, you know, I've always wanted to, you know, help people and, you know, be there to help enable other musicians to, you know, you know, I love teaching, you know, um, and, you know, help, you know, people making records and, you know, help them make the best thing that they can make, you know, and, uh, but as far as that goes, I think, you know, a lot of my goals, you know, it's like, I'm, you know, I'm doing what I really like to do. So, yeah, I think it's, it's turned out great. Any bad habits? Oh, I got tons of bad habits. You have to ask Annie about that. <laughs> ask Annie about my bad habits. <laughs> Sometimes I have guys say, oh, nothing. I said, well, get your wife on the phone. Just get oh, your, get your yeah. wife over just, here. Yeah, just get Annie on the yeah, phone. No, yeah. But no, I, you know, I would say one of my bad habits is I walk way too fast. 
But, you know, I look at it this way, you know, it, 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 at my age, you know, That's I'm going to keep walking fast until yeah. I can. Hell yeah. yeah. But, you know, sometimes like I'll just, you know, I'll get out of the car, you know, and I'll just be in the, if I go into the store or something, I get out of the car, I'm in there in two seconds. I don't dick <laughs> around. I'm, I'm like, I haul ass, you know, and probably too much sometimes where I just like, you know, I move too fast. People tease me about it. No, that's a good thing. I think, you know, I could see being teased about it. That's a good thing, you know, for a lot of health reasons, just, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of things, I think, actually. Two more questions, man. Uh, and I really appreciate everything. Oh, yeah. Toughest decision you ever had to make or hardest thing you ever had to do? Toughest decision. Boy, I don't know. Hardest thing I've ever had to do? Boy, that would be a lot of things, I would say. Um, hmm. I would say probably maybe, you know, moving from, you know, New York to Nashville, that was a tough decision. You know, even though I, you know, once I, once I actually did it, I never looked back and realized it was the greatest thing to do, but just the, you know, taking myself out of the out of my comfort zone and yeah. moving for a million miles away. So actually, what I what I, actually probably not, not the move from Nash, New York to Nashville. It was really the move from Illinois to to New York. Yeah, that, that was a tough sense. decision. You know, mo- you know, I moved like, you know, I was two hours from my family, and now I'm going to move sixteen hours from my family sure. and and comfort zone. You know, that was a big step. You know, taking that big risk and sure. Um, I also think even if you had said the move, just because the outcome was positive doesn't mean the decision making process wasn't difficult. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, because that's I mean, and oftentimes that's you know what happens because because you were willing to make a tough decision, you got that reward. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's just kind of how shit works. It seems like, mm-hmm. but you know, that's a lot easier to do when you're. I think that's a lot easier when you're younger. Yeah. You know, it's easier in a way, even as, though it's really hard, it's easier to take that real big risk because you've still got your life ahead of you, you know, mm. to, you know, yeah, you still got a lot of years where, okay, I moved there and what if, if it doesn't pan out, you can always go somewhere else and, you know, start all over, but then you can start all over at any age. At I any guess. time. Yeah, it was funny. My son was saying something about, cause I'm trying to encourage him to do something and he, I said, man, it's just like. I said it's it's just like when you signed up to wrestle, you know, you weren't wrestling, and then you signed up. He goes, "Yeah, Dad, but that was easy. I just went and did it." And I said, "You know what, man? That's how everything is. It's just in your head, mm-hmm. you know. After the fact, you realize, oh, I just had to go do it, you know. Yeah, and it's it's kind of weird like that, you know. It's, there's nothing really that's like. I mean, you got to work, of course, you know. That's, but you know, nothing's really like." Scaling Everest, unless you're scaling Everest, you know. Yeah, our the fears, our our, our fears are so much more imagined than. Yeah, yeah, that than that, you that know, guy on your shoulder talking in your ear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Last question, Pat, and I really appreciate everything. You're a really easy guy to talk with, man. I could see why you get calls all the time. I couldn't see you ever pissing anybody off. Um, well, you just hang I'll, I'll ask your wife. <laughs> 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 most important lesson your business has taught you um i think uh probably what i was talking about earlier you know that what it's taught me is that whole leap of faith what i was telling you about it's taught me how to be you know to not be afraid you know of the future and um yeah, you know, there was like I told you, I, I when I was younger, having a, you know, I had to get a job right out of college, and I was like, holy crap, you know, I need to make my own way in this life, you know, I need to like, I need to make a living, you know, to survive, you know, and so that's, I think that's what this business has taught me that like I can make a living and survive in this business, and. How that happens, 
it's a mystery to me. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, part of it is, you know, being prepared, you know, being prepared, which, which, which means work on, you know, means practice your freaking guitar, you know, and your harmonica and, you know, but then again, you know, I also look at that as it's, it's not practice and it's not work for me. It's never been that way. It's always been something that I want to do because I like doing it. You know, I'm just compelled by it. I'm compelled to pick up the guitar and the harmonic and play it, you know, and the more I play it, the more I want to play it. Yeah. And it's always been that way for me. It's never been a drudgery or something that I had to do. And I think if, and if, you know, if, if it is drudgery and it's something you feel like you have to do, then you're not supposed to be playing music. I don't think, I don't think people, I can't think of, I know of anybody who doesn't want to play their guitar who's a successful musician. No. I mean, so you, you have, this is but, so difficult. There has to be the, the, the underlying enjoyment of it yeah, for sure. And, and it's not like, and I don't mean this with any sort of disrespect or slight. It's not like it's a tremendously, like everybody's making shit tons of money doing it. So even if you hate it, you could overlook it for the cash, you know, there, mm -hmm. there's highs and lows and mm -hmm. you know, the highs are high, but the lows are probably really low. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, it's, if you're doing it just for the money, you know? Yeah. I don't know anybody well, who's successful that can play music just for the money. No, I mean, no. Seems a little far fetched. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, you got to do it cause you love doing it. And, yeah. and I still love doing it. Well, that comes across loud and clear. And just so you know, I cannot tell you how many guys in town have told me you got to talk with Pat Ferguson, and he's such a good player. So you're, uh, for whatever that's worth, everybody you know talks real highly of you. Or you your payments have, well, your checks all cleared to them. One of the two. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's nice to hear. I have a lot of friends here, and I have enormous respect for, you know, so many good guitar players in Nashville. You know, and I'm. And there's, and I'm really glad about that because it keeps you, keeps you humble and it keeps you working at it. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hey man, let me tell everybody where they could find you. First of all, it's Pat Bergeson. It's B E R G E S O N. And you can find it at Pat Berg, Berg I'm going to say your name wrong now. Bergeson.com. Um, tell you a couple of things. Pat's got a, two CDs out. One is called Hippie Dance. It's a cool, it's a cool album. It's got funk, it's funk, blues, jazz, kind of like a New Orleans vibe. And he also has another one, which is a tribute to Chet Atkins called Country Gentleman. And you can find them both on patbergeson.com. Again, that's B-E-R-G-E-S-O-N. He is on the road with Tommy Emanuel often. In July, he's got a gig, and you can tell me where it is. It's with Steve Cropper, Jack Pearson, uh, Jerry Douglas. And where is that at? That's the Tommy Emanuel Guitar Camp oh, okay. in Memphis. Right. The Tommy. Yeah, that'll that's July. And yeah, you can sign up for it. It's July uh let's see, twenty three to twenty seven in Memphis. Great. You can find I think you just go to Tommy Emanuel Guitar Camp dot com. And then Pat's doing something similar in August in Colorado. They have a pretty big festival out there, I think, right? Yeah, that's the uh, Rocky Mountain Guitar Camp. Right. Um, that's called that's Rocky Mountain Guitar Camp, and that's in Estes Park, August fifth to ninth. Great. And then it looks like I may be doing the Copper Mountain Guitar Festival that's right was, after that. That's what I was thinking of. Right. Yeah, great. that's a guitar town hmm. in Copper Mountain on the eleventh, tenth, eleventh. I think I'll be there for that this year, and then uh, yeah, and uh, on. Every, every Saturday, 11.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., Pat will bring you your champagne to have with your early morning breakfast. He has a gig with Charles Wig Walker, soul singer, at Acme Feed and Seed, right down at the bottom of Broadway. Uh, Woolworth on 5th every Friday night from 7 to 9. He occasionally plays out with his wife. She's a singer. Annie Selleck is her name. And you'll sometimes find Pat at Rudy's Jazz Room. And if you are interested in doing some lessons, I know guitar lessons, Pat occasionally takes students, go to his webpage at patbergeson.com and uh, just hit him up on the contact form. I would encourage you to look at Pat on YouTube. He's a phenomenal player, both in uh, harmonica and guitar. So if you're looking for lessons in either, he's probably a guy you want to consider. 
likewise, if you're looking for session work for guitar or harmonica, he's a guy you want to consider. And um, I think that's it, man. Did I leave anything out? No, I think that's good for now, man. Thanks for bragging on me, Craig. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, man. I really <laughs> Thanks for your time, man. I really appreciate it. I you're pretty it. you're a pretty cool cat yourself, man. I'm okay. <laughs> Talk to my wife. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. Right. Uh listen, man. Thank you for everything. I really appreciate it. Good. I hope to run into you down the road. Yeah, yeah. I'll be up there for now. Maybe for now, maybe we'll uh connect. Okay. If I'm here, we'll we, we'll do it. We'll go lunch or something. I, I get to look at your beer can collection. For sure, man. <laughs> it's the shit. I'm telling you. All right, All right, everybody. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Thanks so much to Pat Bergeson for spending this time with us. Please check Pat out online. It's Pat Berg Bergeson. B. I keep messing up your name. I apologize. Pat Bergeson at patbergeson.com. B e r g e s o n. And go to everyonelovesguitar.com, sign up to get notified. Get on our newsletter list. You get notified about future episodes along with some early product announcement. And remember, most important, happiness is a choice, man, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have some fun. Till next time, I'm out, everybody. Peace and love. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Thank you.